All right. So to those just joining us, welcome. <clears throat> we are here for the second installment, which is going to be kind of a long installment of the um, Star Wars Red Harvest book study. We did this last week, but I said, just keep reading. We'll do what we can. It's a shortish novel anyway. And to be honest, I don't have a lot. I, I can't dig into this novel as I've done in the Throne trilogy or uh, Scoundrels or Kenobi or any of the other Star Wars novels we've done because one, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, not a horror guy. Uh, it, and two, it, you know, so it's just not something that I can, you know, really sink my teeth into, but I am going to pull out writing tips and things that I can. And, and Al is here as a, as a horror aficionado himself. So he can actually speak a little bit more to that. I'm sorry, not Al. Al is not here with me. With me on every Star Wars stream we have is Mr. Al Baca, who somehow wrote Big Al instead of Al Baca. I don't know what's up with that. Welcome, Al Baca. I never wrote Al Baca. <laughs> Did you never? Okay. It's short for... <laughs> Al Baga, big Al. <laughs> and I must disagree with you. What's that? I think I think Red Harvest is easily the kind of story you can sink your teeth into. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. I was going to say, I don't mean in general. I just mean me personally, but then I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> sink your teeth into. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, so I've got to apologize a little bit for tonight because uh, on the one hand, um, we do have a lot of chapters to cover, so we're going to go kind of quickly, but also, um, not quickly, but but giving each chapter sort of a cursory look. They're short chapters anyway. Um, also, I'm a little out of sorts today because this morning was my daughter's surgery. Uh, her adenoids removed and tubes in her ears and everything like that, and um, she's good. How? She's super dopey. Good, good. <laughs> Still super say dopey. How she was doing. Yeah. She had really horrible infection in her ears. Even they saw it because they, we've been trying to put drops and stuff like that. But she's because of her autism, she can't tell us, you know, when things hurt and stuff like that. So we've been trying to gauge as much as we can. But they had to like scrape the infection out inside of her ear. So uh, there is some pain, but they gave her some good, pretty good hopped up pain meds and everything. So she's loopy, but happy and content and, um, you know, very well content. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a little sick. I know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but she's good. I, I, I don't want to, but she's had like this kind of issue for a while, right? Well, that's why they wanted to go. That's why they eventually sent us to the ENT because she kept having right. reoccurring ear infections. And um, they found out that her adenoids were swollen and it was probably a, a ear canal issue, which is why they went in and put the tubes and all of that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. so, but she should be good now. Um, you know, it's just the, the recovery and everything. And uh, it, it was just a day out, you know, I had to get her in there really, really early and I don't go to sleep till late anyway. So, it was a weird day and some family was up to, to help uh, with her and everything. So I woke up, I, I finally got her settled and um, I took a nap and woke up just in time really to jump on the stream, the, the pre-show that I did there. So I didn't even have a lot of time to go back over and sit and take some notes. So we're going to kind of be, uh, you know, I've reread it of course, before we um, looked at any of these segments, but you know, we're going to kind of rediscover some of these things ourselves here. So, <laughs> so basically we're starting at chapter seven, right? Marfa. Uh, Oh yeah, did we already did chapter six, didn't we? Yeah, we did. That's right. Yeah. I um, I was looking at the YouTube thumbnail, but I forgot last time I actually had it one thumbnail from behind. But you're right. Yeah, we covered six last video, so we do chart with seven now. Yeah, because uh, the first this is the first time we're me uh, as far as the book study we are meeting uh, Hestizo Hestizo Trace. Yeah. No relation. To, no relation to Trace and Rafa. <laughs> Yeah, so chapter seven is about finally meeting our main character, our 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 hero, so to speak, you know, in terms of our protagonist, and it's Hestizo Trace. Hestizo is a um, is a Jedi, and this, remember, this is Old Republic, so a lot of these uh, rules and things. Maybe for anybody just joining us, I'll kind of give the brief recap again. This is Old Republic era, long before Darth Bane and the Rule of Two or anything like that. So the Sith are still an empire. Sith are an empire, and uh, they're at war with the Republic. There are a lot of history behind what, what all that was. And uh, the Jedi, this vast order, you know, uh, even vaster and more ingrained and more diverse than it was when we saw in the prequel era. And Estizo is, a, I forgot what the word is. She's like a bio biologist in the, or, or um, plant biologist in the force or whatever. She, kind of like she, a, bot a botanist. Basically. Yeah, yeah. She deals with um, force sensitive plants, specifically this one, the Murakami orchid which as we know from the last chapters is the one that Darth Scabarus was, uh, Lord Scabarus was, was intent on finding for his uh, diabolical experiments that he had going on in his tower there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we, we go to this uh, 
Jedi greenhouse basically on this planet, where Stizo is this force sensitive uh, botanist. Yeah, they're working with the plant, and uh, we meet her, meet a little bit of, her, find out a little bit more her connection. She can actually talk to the plant. She can talk to the plant um, telepathically, sort of, and uh, you know she she's there to to keep it alive, to kind of teach it and whatnot. So some plants are sort of sentient and force sensitive. Not every plant in general. It's not like a, you know. Um, there's a spirit in the trees and the rock and all that kind of stuff, you know, but it's, um, you know, it, it, some plants are like that. So we meet a Stizo and then shortly thereafter, we meet um, a character by the name of Tulka, who is a whippid. And I meant to go shoot. I don't know if my, um, I'm going to look up the image here. I, I don't know if I have, I have a, the uh, Excitopedia of Alien Species in Star Wars, but I don't know if they actually have a proper picture of the whippid or if it's, um, just like a little encyclopedic entry with no picture. So let me uh, let me try and look it up here to show you. But a whippet is uh, this is Tulka is a bounty hunter. So he ends up being a bounty hunter that was uh, hired by Lord Scabbers because we met one of the other bounty hunters in the last chapter who tried to pull off a fake orchid for Lord Scabbers mm -hmm. and Lord Scabbers whew, punished him quite a bit there. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say punished. I mean, he gave him a good meal. <laughs> so what you did there is a disgusting meal disgusting meal um all right there we go let's see there's a certain image that does a really good job. there we go okay i found it um the whippets look a little bit like come on almost like a wookie on steroids <laughs> it's, it's like a, a wookie a wookie crossed with a um boar yeah yeah it's uh i'll, I'll share the screen here So that's uh that's that's an actual uh rendition of Tulka, our whippet that's in this book. There is a Tulk uh, a whippet um bounty hunter. They they even though they are um advanced a race, you know, they have space travel and whatnot, they still kind of use the spears and the bow and arrow. They're very barbaric. Big bottom underbite tusks there. Pretty wicked looking. Here's another artistic rendering of it. So terrifying, utterly terrifying. But you did have uh whippets who were actually Jedi, you know, as we see here. And another comic that's not Tolka, but um, Tolka here. So he is there, and and he just completely infiltrates this. This he's a, he's a, he's a, he's he's dangerous. He's a badass, right? There's just no other way of saying it. He's um he infiltrates the uh, the, the the Jedi uh, greenhouse there. Pretty mortally wounds Hestizo's co-worker, and he asks her. He's got like his foot on her head, like about to crunch her skull, and asks her where is the orchid, and she <laughs> takes him to it. She's at there, you know, she's at spear point. And uh, she tells him, and she realizes it's a mistake as soon as it leaves her mouth, but she says it won't survive if you take it out of this environment without mm -hmm. me. She needs to be with it because it's a, it's a delicate plant. She's trying to increase its tolerance, but it's somewhat delicate and it needs her with her if they're going to go outside of that environment so that she can keep it alive because that's her gift in the forest. Her gift in the forest is to um, yeah. bring life to, to plant life and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, well, her master, Wal, Wal Bennis, I don't know if it was her master, but... Uh... He, he, no, I don't think he, I don't think he was mortally wounded, but he was no, severely he, yeah. wounded. Yeah, yeah we I find mean, out later that he's convalescing, he was, but he, yeah, he's in a back to tank or something. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty insane what happens to him though. Um, all right, so she takes <clears throat> Tolka takes uh, her and the plant along, and remember that uh, in in the chapter when the, the last one of the last chapters when that bounty hunter came to Scabrous and tried to pass off the orchid, Scabrous asked him. Is that all you brought? You haven't brought anybody else with you? My, my co, my co uh, bounty hunters outside or whatever. And that's how Scabrous knew that he was lying because Scabrous knew that this kind of orchid would need a Jedi with it to keep it alive. But he withheld that information from the hunt bounty hunters so that they would really bring him the right one. So uh, chapter eight, then the next chapter, after we meet Hestizo, after he takes Hestizo with him, we're going to find out the ship in a second. We jump to her brother. Um, and her brother's name is Rojo Trace, and he is basically a Jedi warrior. He's on Geonosis to in, 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 uh, investigate a fallen Sith ship, and we see that he's very, very skilled. He's very uh, good at his job. And suddenly, <laughs> while he's there, yeah, I'll, I'll tell this in a second. But suddenly, he gets this. Um, uh, 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 he's linked to his sister. I think she might even be his twin. I forget, or just his sister. But they're linked in the Force, obviously, siblings. And he realizes that something's wrong. He realizes she's been taken. And he gets a glimpse through the force of this, this 
person that's taken her. So Tolka, the, the bounty hunter, get you to turn your mic down just or your amp, uh, headphones down a little bit there, Al. Getting that. Uh, I had actually. Um, so he tries to contact Tolka. And uh, what does he say to Tolka, Al? <laughs> Listen to me, Trace told him. I don't know who you are, but I'm in possession of a very special set of skills. If you bring my sister back right now, unharmed, then I'll let you go. But if you don't, I promise you, I will track you down. I will find you and I will make you pay. <laughs> so a very blatant nod to Liam Neeson there, <laughs> which is kind of fun that, I mean, Joe Schreiber is a, is a, a Schreiber or Schreiber. I, I need to look that up one time to get it right definitively, but, um, Probably Schreiber. Schreiber. He's a good writer and he's very skilled. So it's like, it's funny to see him having that much fun with the work, you know, putting in a blatant uh, reference there. Mm-hmm. But Rojo's going to go look for his sister. So you've got a hero coming after our main character, Hestizo. Number 10, I just love the uh, the chapter title, Strapping on Ghosts. This follows Hestizo there on the, um, well, on the ship. Well, nine is Miracraw, which is the name of the ship. Yeah. Nine is the ship, and then uh, and then ten continues. But both these chapters are going in Hestizo's uh, perspective. But he wakes uh, up in this. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, were you were you going right into ten or? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna describe what happened to her in nine. I just. Oh, okay. Numbers, yeah, because. Uh, but I just want I just wanted to do as as you're getting to it. You know, I really got a predator vibe mm-hmm. when they were when they were talking about uh, Talca and his ship and his trophies and how yeah. he processed them. Yeah, so let's describe it a little bit, and then I'll comment on it. I th- what I think that works as a writer to do something like that, because you're right. Uh, I didn't put that connection until you said it, because I haven't seen the Predator since I was like 14, and that was like, well, it was like once. But um, but yeah, Stizo wakes up in in Tolka's kind of treasure room of his of his uh, ship there, and she's tied up there next to the plant. And he's that's basically his room where he decomposes the body parts of his victim so that he can thread together the skulls or you know make little trophies out of it. It's really disgusting. He's got like pots boiling and the putrid flesh kind of being burnt off. He's got these uh these um oh, what are they called the scarab beetles to yeah. eat off the flesh and things. And there's mold and moss on parts of the inside of the ship. Her being there actually flourishes the moss because it's her mere presence helps plant life being there. Uh, it's pretty disgusting, really disgusting actually. But it is very predator-like, as you said. That's kind of stuff the predator would do in the movie, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he uh, he would like boil he would like boil things down. He had the skulls and uh, spinal co- spinal columns and and things like that as trophy mm-hmm. as part of his trophies. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as a writer, you know, you're writing something like horror, especially a pop horror book, like a popular horror book, like this is. It's in the Star Wars universe. You don't have a lot of space, right? This is a pretty short book. This is the the hard copy here, and it's um, you know, it's not that long of a book. It's fast paced, fast moving. You don't, you're not world building. You're not starting from scratch. You're having to stick with a world that's pre built there. But he's having to inject something like horror, something that's not typically in the Star Wars universe, into the universe for this book. So one way to do that without having to spend pages and pages of extra world building and stuff that the fans might even reject is just to use different tropes. Tropes are not bad when used properly. So something like the uh, the quote from Taken, that's kind of a funny little thing. That's no big deal. But a qu- uh, trope like Tulka, if you make him look a little bit like the Predator, the reader will suddenly associate the or, or, uh, attributes of the Predator with Tulka. And that's a that's a smart re- uh, writer move. As long as you're not as long as you're not um, relying on that stuff as a crutch. But if you use it, you know, uh, tactfully. It, it, can, it can save yourself some work. It can go ahead and create in your readers a clear mind of what kind of character this is. At the same time, you make it your own character. Tolka really becomes a quite a fascinating character throughout the book. So um, so it's an interesting thing to do as a writer if you don't have a lot of time and space to develop you know, a whole, or you don't think your readers will want to sit through a whole development of your new world building to understand this type of character. That's one of the pitfalls writers fall into quite often. And I also like how the orchid becomes quite an interesting character yes. itself. Yeah. Feel, yeah, the orchid I feel bad for for it. Yeah, the orchid talking to um talking to, to Estizo and, and very terrified, you know, something's wrong. I know something's wrong. Where are we? And Estizo can't tell her much, you know, tell it much. So um 
they they land on this planet. It's freezing cold outside, and this is the planet. I, I keep forgetting the name of the planet. Al, remind me if you remember. But uh -huh. where the uh, the Sith Academy is, where Lord Scabrous holds sway and all of that. Um, they yeah. land there. It's cold, and uh, Talca gives her some furs. And these are furs of basically recent kills, aliens or whatever, or animals or whatever that he's recently killed. But she needs something to cover up and to be able to bear walking through the snow towards uh, the, the tower where he's going to deliver her. And she says that the, the kills were so fresh that she could sense through the forest the living souls that had recently inhabited those skins. And it was like strapping on ghosts. That is mm -hmm. such a wonderful line. That is just, oh, it's creepy. And it's just, you know, it, it's a perfect use of everything we know about Jedi and the star Wars universe to evoke a bit of visceral horror. You know, we don't really know what it's like to sense a living being through the force. This is something fictional, but we've heard about it enough to sort of have a preconceived idea of it and to spin it and twist it with a little bit of horror element like that is, Ooh, you know, <laughs> actually strapping on the skins of these beings that you can still feel alive or vestments uh, vestiges of their life. So, <clears throat> um, Let's see. Uh, we in chapter eleven, we go, we go back to Rojo. He's gone over. He's, he's back at the. Okay, Burns said Korriban. No, it's not Korriban. Korriban would be our. When we get to um, Korriban's lost at this point. It's not until Darth Bane trilogy that we see Korriban retaken in an academy tried to be rebuilt there. Korriban was the ancient world for uh, you know in the in the Return of our um, Knights of the Old Republic games and stuff like that. We know that the academies were there, but no, at this point, it's uh, it's another. Planet. I was waiting on Al to find it. Usually he. Uh, Odysseur Festine. That doesn't sound right. Odysseur Festine. The cold morning air of Odysseur Festine. Taste of like ozone. Yeah. Maybe it's a pronunciation. Oh, oh, Odysseur Faustin. Odysseur Faustin. Oh, okay. Well, it's just different. I just pronounced Od it. Wrong. Odysseur Faustine. I was like, that Odysseur Faustine. Doesn't sound quite right somehow. Odysseur Faustin is the name of the planet. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, good try though. Good try. Excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Old Republic. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't come with the pronunciation guide in the book. I get you. Um, uh, but yeah, in chapter eleven, mm -hmm. I think it is, uh, Rojo is is doing his due diligence. He's on the tra track of his sister, so he goes to the planet. Uh he, he sees where Tolka captured her. He's trying to pick up a trail. And he does. He sees a video or a hollow recording, rather, of the, the ship that took off, and he sees, I forget what it's called, but some um some scoring on the outside of the ship which is only going to be there if it had to go through a planet that had this certain chemical stuff in its atmosphere. So with that, he can actually pare it down to a certain number of planets. And then he goes out on the hunt at certain bounty hunter spots and whatever, and tries to get people drunk and, and uh, interrogate them, you know, through the force a little bit and eventually finds the name of Talca finds the name of where Talca was, uh, was heading where his job was and stuff. Doesn't quite know what it is yet. But. Yeah. Cause he's, he's very much like a, uh, um, like a C the like a Jedi CSI. Yeah, yeah. And that's the cool thing about the old republic is that when you go back into a time in which the Jedi aren't so so marginalized. I mean, it's cool and it's wonderful in the original trilogy. It's uh, this is what makes the story so great that the Jedi are kind of on the hunt for survival, you know, and they're and they're coming together in a reborn, a resurgence of rebellion and mm -hmm. stuff. That's wonderful. But going back into the old republic days, you get to play with a lot of different things. Like one of my favorite eras in the old Republic that I really, really wish if anybody ever bought Disney and actually knew how to do the characters, right. This would be a wonderful live action series to do the, uh, oh, I'm not blanking on so many names right now. Cause I'm tired. I think it's the SIS, the secret information or, or no, that's not, that's not the right. Anyway, there is basically a, uh, a secret service or a secret uh, CIA basically for the Republic. Mm. And, um, this Jedi master's son is actually a member of it. And there's a rogue Jedi on his team. There's a Twi'lek uh, bounty hunter on his team or thief or whatever. And uh, they could, that could have been an amazing series. Them out in the ship doing these missions for, for the Republic and whatnot. It would have been a cool, like firefly esque series, mm -hmm. but, um, but you can play with those different kind of tropes in the old Republic. So as here, as Al said, you know, Rojo trace kind of a CSI it's set in the Jedi world. It's kind of cool to see. Um, chapter 12, we, we get Hestizo meeting, meeting um scabrous tolka brings her there delivers her there you know he told his payment will be outside so he leaves and scabrous takes the orchid from her because he realizes this is the real deal and he goes over to nictor remember our poor nictor the student who'd been mind controlled by uh lusk to to uh, almost practically kill himself in the saber but then he stops him 
momentarily and he sends him to the tower and poor Nictor wakes up in the tower uh, naked from the waist up and he's got these tubes injected into the vertebra of his spine. He's in horrible pain. By the time poor uh, Hestizo comes there and sees him, he's almost beast-like. He's almost devolved into an animal from the pain. He just has this smacking of his lips and he's just, you know, grunting over there and the, uh, in the in the cage that he's in. Well, when Lord Scabbers puts the the Murakami orchid in the in the vial that's connected to those tubes, it suddenly goes into his body and creates in him the desired effect that Scabbers wanted. It makes him this superhuman zombie, basically. Well, but, was, I, I don't think it was when, the full effect of what he. I, I think I think it kind of went a little awry on him. Well, he's going to find out how it goes awry in a second. Yeah. yeah. He's he's trying to make this superhuman like creature. He is trying to make this zombie like creature. And uh Nictor busts through the cage and everything like that and then Scabrus tells him, "Now, come to me. I am your master." You know, tries to do this kind of Frankenstein moment. <laughs> and there's the twist that I was talking about because he realizes Nictor's not listening to anybody, not even him. Nictor charges him and actually bites into his face, I think it is, right, Al? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. He bites it. Oh, bites into his face. Now, at the same time here, we've uh, Juros, I think it was his name, of the Jedi. Remember we talked in the last time about um, Skopik, the Zabrak? Go ahead. He's, a, he's Sith, not Jedi. Yeah, I'm sorry, Sith. I said Jedi. Jor sorry, sorry, Jorah sorry. Ostrogoth? Yeah, yeah, Jorah Ostrogoth. Jorah Ostrogoth. Ostrogoth. Yeah, he's... Um, he's the student who was, was blackmailed into going up there and finding out what's going on. Right. The, the Zabrak kind of blackmailed him into that. So he's watching behind some crates. He's snuck into the tower and he's watching all of this and he sees Nictor suddenly break out of the, the cage and go crazy. And then Nictor ends up flailing towards the window, I think, but Jura found some, finds himself in between Nictor and the window. So Nictor basically, grabs Jura, like tackles him and they both fall through the window, fall from the top of the tower all the way to the ground. We don't know what's happened to them at this point in that, in that uh, turmoil though, Scabrous has been attacked. Nictor's escaped. Hestizo ends up escaping the tower herself. So she's on the Sith planet, nowhere to go. No, no clue how to do these things. And she's out there in the snow alone at this point. And that brings us to chapter 13. I think it's chapter 13. Um, no. Dragon teeth. I think that's that's where uh yeah no that's I just explained that chapter 14 I think 14 yeah yeah 14 remember we talked about um another character on the uh all right so Lusk was the was Lusk was the bully the one who was mind controlling people right. into um into joining Scabrous and bringing them to him and whatnot. Lusk is the one who lusts for power. It's a Sith Academy. So everybody's stabbing everybody in the back, quite literally everybody. It's a power struggle. It's a horrible place to be. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's like how Slytherin to the 10th power. Right? <laughs> you know. Um, but we did cover a brief chapter last time of a student by the name of Ra'at. And he was somebody who's got aspirations to be a warrior that would rival even Lusk. So he's, tra he's training, he's training, he's training with his, his, uh, master there and he wants to eventually challenge lusk well we have now this this it's good pacing because one of the things that schreiber does well is that we have these intense chapters of horrible violence horrible oh my gosh i can't believe that just happened and then we'll get a chapter that completely cuts scene and we're over here in something else completely where there's no um crisis happening yet you know horror. and it's good kind of a pacing because in horror if you just had everybody on the edge of their seat all the time horror is all about trying to manipulate someone's adrenaline right and adrenaline does wear off if you keep them tense 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 it suddenly just doesn't do anything it's like a drug right you need to kind of inject yeah. them with a jolt you, and then let it need, ease away you need you need a breather yeah exactly kind of let things process kind of because you want the roller coaster mm -hmm. you know yeah a roller coaster you just don't you know keep going down 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 it's the ups and the downs and the twists and the turns that's yeah that's where the fun is. That's the adrenaline rush. That's a good, that's a good analogy. Cause it is the process of getting up or down, you know, and, and right. that, yeah, you're right. That's good. <clears throat> so we do meet Lusk and, uh, and, and he is, um, uh, no, Ra'at is going to challenge Lusk. Lusk is just uh, walking around outside. He's on his way to somewhere. I forget the dining hall or something like that. And Ra'at goes behind him and tries to challenge him. And uh, Lusk is like, you don't want to do this, seriously. But Rad is intent on it. He, he throws him a, a practice saber, and he wants to do this challenge right now, right here and now. And uh, they're they're fighting, and, and Rat's kind of holding his own pretty well. But Lusk is clearly, you know, still the better fighter. But suddenly, 
and we see that Schreiber is playing with time a little bit, which is kind of cool too. This is one way to do it. If you're going to to give yourself a little bit of a, a pacing roller coaster kind of sense in a horror, play with the time. So we find out that everything just happened between Lusk and Rat, them challenging each other happened while that whole tower scene was going on. So at mm -hmm. the end of our scene with Lusk and Rat going at each other as a, as a duel, that's when Nictor and Jura fall down from the, uh, from the tower. So these two bodies come crashing down. As soon as they crash down, though, Nictor gets up. <laughs> and they recognize him as Nictor, and they see this this bloody, pulpy, you know, zombie creature of Nictor who just can't be killed. Lusk grabs Raat, like Raat's kind of like at this point, oh my gosh, what is that? We should totally work together at this point. And Lusk just grabs Raat and throws him at Nictor to give himself a chance <laughs> to run away. <laughs> Total <laughs> Sith move. I guess like, what a Sith thing to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Sith move all the way. <laughs> um. And now we have Lusk trying to come to terms with what is what is going on here. Chapter fifteen again. We we break uh we break scene again. We go to a little pacing thing and we go back into the tower with Lord Scabrus after he's been uh, attacked by Nictor and Nictor's escaped. We find him. The chapter is called Triage, which is a cool name because he he knows that he's infected with this Murakami virus that he's given to uh to Nictor because Nictor bit him. So he's got this, basically, it's like a walking IV. It's like a high-tech uh, um, Sith thing, but it's a blood transfusion, like a constant blood transfusion to keep the infection at bay so that he still has time to think and be his own person and whatnot. You know, maybe this will cure him or whatever. We don't know, but he's injecting himself with this and he's focusing on, to get him through this, the absolute hate he has for Hestizo, the Jedi. Mm -hmm. Now, Steezo's done nothing to him, right? She just happens to be a Jedi and she's there. But the fact that she's there, she is a Jedi, ha pure unadulterated hatred of her is kind of focusing his mind and getting her through this. That's a really good way to paint uh, your villains, but also, you know, a good picture of the Sith. It's very consistent with what we know of the Sith, uh, especially in the old Republic era here, uh, as we do in the in later stories. And it's uh, tells us what kind of character Scabras is, you know, nothing's his fault. Um, Everybody there is for him to use. They're for his use, you know. Uh, Jedi, Sith, enemy, ally alike, you know. Total uh, sociopath. Um, chapter 16, Convocation. So now... Uh, and of course, in the meantime, uh, Hestizo's taken off. She's, yeah. she, she's, she's used the, uh, the distraction to kind of escape. Exactly. Or, or at least started an escape. Yeah, at least escape the tower, exactly. And that's where we pick up in chapter 16 as we find Estizo suddenly, the poor Estizo Trace, a trained Jedi, but not really a warrior Jedi. Her thing, like I said, is, is botany with fort sensitive plants and whatnot. And she's out there on this planet in the cold, in the, uh, the, the snow on a Sith planet, no allies whatsoever. She does see eventually a, a kind of sort of a convocation. That's the name of the chapter of Sith students who are being called there, sort of like an assembly, like an announcement. And a Sith leader is telling them, there's um there's an emergency that you know, something's going on you, you're to return to your rooms other than eating at the mess hall you know mm -hmm. mess hall I forget what they call it, the dining hall or whatever um you're to stay in your rooms and, and quietly study because there's an emergency going on. Estizo at this point is um spied by one of the jet one of the Sith students <clears throat> and she sticks out like a sore thumb even through the force the Sith student realizes. Yeah. But she's, she's a also Jedi. And she's also still in contact with the, with the orchid. Yeah, which yeah. Is and, still kind of there. The essence of it is still there. Yeah, the orchid is what kind of saves her. So even though the actual physical plant has been destroyed, you know, in this in this um in this vat or whatever that ended up getting mixed up and went into nectar, the essence of it, the force essence of it, is still alive because it's a sentient force sensitive plant so you can see how it could be sort of alive through the force and it, so it's in nictor's blood basically or in the blood of everybody that nictor's infected already mm -hmm. and it's still speaking out to Hestizo. and it's still the same same orchid that she knew and it's terrified it is it can see things though now because it's being spread through a number of people so it tries to warn her right like it warns her that this sith has seen her and stuff like that and this Sith student tries to to grab her, win some points for himself. He's going to take her to the Masters. This this how somehow this Jedi has been here or whatever. And you think poor Stizo, she's had it now. You know, she just got out of the tower. She's going right back to it. But, but uh, then suddenly I'll read this because it's really cool. And this the chapters are they're very short chapters. They're like three to four pages. 
but they're so it's it's not they're not quite vignettes. You know, vignette is when you write a story with a bunch of little random scenes, not random, they're connected, but they're sort of different separate scenes. These are almost vignettes in that they're separate little scenes, but they're so tied to each other and they kind of bob and weave in the time and they really are inextricably linked to the next one and whatever. So they're they're more straight narrative, but they're very vignette like. Um, so let's see. Uh, Zoe saw this. All right. So um, he was still in the process of inhaling when a clawed hand. This is the Sith. A clawed hand clamped down over his lips, silencing him. Ranlaw, this is his name, tried to squirm free, and the back of a wooden spear slammed across the top of his skull with a sharp crack, dropping him sideways. Zoe saw the Sith student tumble forward, his grip falling slack, releasing her hair as he fell. In the place where he'd been hunched over, she saw a great three-fingered hand gripping her shoulder and forcing her back down out of sight, as she realized that she was looking at Tulka. This, his shoulders were arched enough that she could see the quiver of arrows strapped to his back. Spinning the spear easily around, the whippet raised the business end again, swung it around, and thrust it pointed directly at Zoe's face, close enough that she could feel it pressing against her neck. All of this was accomplished in absolute silence. Cheek. What do you? What, what's that? Her cheek. Her cheek. Cheek. Oh yeah, cheek. Um, what are you doing? Tolka didn't budge. His expression was stone. There's something I need to show you. I don't move, and that's the end of the chapter. So. A great mystery. Tolka, this bounty hunter who's been paid. He's given her uh, two scabras. He's been paid. That's his job is done. What does he care about her? Suddenly he comes and saves her from a Sith student and yet still threatens her at, at, at spear end and tells her he wants to show her something. Mm -hmm. At this point, even I, you know, I remember the first time when I was reading this through the horror, I was kind of, you know, sometimes in the horror, I'm kind of like, uh, just get through it because you want to have read all the old Republic or the old Star Wars EU stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but there are moments like this that really intrigued me. Like at this point, I didn't care how horrific it was. I wanted to know what was going on with Tolka. That's a good, you know, when you're writing, even if you're writing something like a visceral genre, like horror in which the genre itself kind of carries a lot of, uh, of reader interest, it's going to draw people to see how horrific you can be. Cause some people just like that for some reason, it doesn't really resonate with people and it doesn't make people stay with your story unless you have good characters, good character mm -hmm. development, good, interesting plots that, that you, even if you have a visceral genre to rely on, you still need all those regular story elements. So it's right. a cool thing there. Okay. Well, like you said, care. I mean, you watch a, you watch a horror film, you only get invested in it. If you care about the ones who are like getting killed. Or yeah. slaughtered or being chased. Yeah. Uh, I mean, after that, it's it's it just becomes a you know mindless snuff film if you don't. I mean, well, like you were saying when, when Al just read the first five chapters, it was really setting the the, the stage, and we didn't meet any heroes yet. Now was saying it's kind of cool, but I don't really know who to root for yet. You know, and, and yeah, exactly. That's why. Um. So in chapter seventeen, we we switch pace again, and we meet another character. This is a young Sith student named Kendra. And she is in the library and we meet the librarian who's a really cool character. Uh, he's a netty. That's the, uh, the, the race he is, but I'm trying to find his name here in particular. Um, he's there. Uh, Dolly, um, Dialis. Dallas. Yeah. Dallas. Yeah. Dallas is the, uh, is the librarian. And let me show you a picture of Nettie's here. And it will try and for those who don't know, because I know some people are kind of versed in this and do know, but a Nettie is a, is a tree like alien, sort of like Groot. Think about Groot from, uh, from, from Marvel. Oh, That's a good way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a good way of, uh, of describing it. Nettie's are got these tree like beings. So they've got uh, sort of vines and barkish, you know, they kind of grow like a tree, you know, different uh, artists have rendered them in different ways, but, Dallas, the, the netty here, the librarian, has interwoven himself into the library itself. So they can kind of move and grow, just as we saw Groot do, for example. You know, they can kind of grow themselves and move through different things. Well, Netty has, uh, Dallas, the netty has grown through the cracks and the holes of the library to where he can't even leave the library. He is intricately interwoven into the building itself. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, so Kendra is there studying in the in the desk, and she hears and senses something kind of descending from her, and it's like his face just kind of coming down from the ceiling. It's like 
he's like he's taken over the building and is alive with it is the sort of wooden creature building you know it's it's really quite cool yeah so cool. Uh, yeah as i have been the curator of the library for as long as anyone could remember perhaps a thousand years or more <clears throat> yeah and that's cool too that you know you've got you think about somebody trying to write a horror story in the star wars universe well the easy way to do it would just be to take a random setting that happens to be in the Star Wars universe and just tell a horrific story and just that just happens to be set in the Star Wars universe. But Schreiber doesn't do that. And I really respect that. He does realize, okay, I'm writing a Star Wars novel too. I need to make use of things in Star Wars. So he makes very good use of Jedi and of Sith and of all of the different alien races. Mm -hmm. It's really cool, you know, that he really takes all of the tools at his disposal and, and makes sure they're part of what he's creating, which is quite cool. Uh, Nettie, the Dallas senses something outside and warns Kendra uh, that you should stay inside. Of course, Kendra says, absolutely not. I'm going to go investigate. She's a Sith. She's got to put it all to her own use, you know. <clears throat> if there's if there's trouble, I can handle it. Not yeah. I know. Don't think so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so chapter 18, we, we go back to Ra'at. We do remember that uh, last time we saw Ra'at, Lust grabbed Ra'at off the ground and pushed him into Nictor so that he could get away. Well, we find out that Ra'at had clambered up this little cliff. He clambered up this little cliff to get away from the creature of Nictor. And he's been hurling rocks and stuff like that down at Nictor. But he realizes that nothing's killing Nictor. Nictor is still climbing. He's still going to climb. He's going to reach Ra'at. There's no way Ra'at can get away um, at this point. Ra'at does eventually, uh, he gets away in a different way. I forget exactly what happens here. Um, Already, Rot realized he couldn't stay up here indefinitely. He needed a better plan. Glancing around him, he'd spotted an even larger pile of rocks, the remains of a second level that had collapsed long before. He'd worked quickly but carefully, piling the slabs up, scraping his fingers and knuckles along the way until he had a tall, precarious stack that was staying upright only because he was holding onto it. Summoning the forest, Rod had focused it on the pile and removed his hands. The rocks teetered but did not fall. Looking around, he saw a nictered thing dragging itself up into the overhang. Its eyes looked hungry on Rot. Come on, then, Rot said, taking a single step away. Nictor charged, and Rot let the stones fall, slamming down the corpse's leg, just below the knee, pinning it there. So you can't kill Nictor, but he at least pinned him with the rocks. And then Rot's taking off. Rot's wounded pretty badly. He needs to get to the infirmary. Rot doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know anything. He just knows that this horrible monster creature that you know was once Nictor, his student, uh, or his, his classmate, has attacked him. So Rot meets Kendra on their way to investigate. I think they're going, or Rod's going to the infirmary anyway. And you do sense a little bit of the Sith mindset here. Rod sees her and Rod starts thinking, I can use her to my advantage. Mm -hmm. I, you know, he knows he's wounded. If anything were to attack him or anybody were to attack him now, he's completely vulnerable. So he could use her being in league with him in company, but he doesn't want to admit vulnerability and admit that he's, he's wounded or whatever. So he just kind of, uh, tries to talk her into, you know, his way or walking with her or whatever. It's very Sith like all the little games yeah. they have to play with these. Like, what, ha what happened to you? I'm fine. She took a step toward him. You're covered in blood. It's not as bad as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> like... Yeah, total total again, Sith move, total Sith move. <clears throat> We're going to see that in Vance a little bit too. And that that starts to get us into a theme, you know? It, it's kind of hard to find a theme in a horror story. Are, it's hard to really put one in there because the readers need to, um, or the writer really needs to be insistent with it. But remember when we looked at Kenobi, one of the ways you discover theme is you look for patterns. You look for repeated uh, situations, repeated um, dialogue, stuff like that. And we find here that there is this repeated theme of working together versus being everyone out for each other uh, or for, for themselves. Rather the Sith are all out for themselves. Zombies by definition, we haven't really gotten to the, to the mass of zombies yet here. But zombies, by definition, are a communal force, right? They're all kind of mm -hmm. working in tandem versus the Sith, who are everyone's out for themselves versus the Jedi. We only have one Jedi on the planet right now, but we know her brother's trying to save her. So you do have this sort of uh, working to save the other to not not, you know, working for for the communal good. And then Tolka kind of in between here, he's a bounty hunter out for his own good. Yet he is sort of yeah. saving Estizo. We he's don't know what's wild, up with he's him a, now. He's a wild card. You know, like yeah. <laughs> yeah so a good theme being built up in the story and again that makes me as a reader want to continue on i remember the first time i was reading it so <clears throat> so uh kendra and rat are, are on their way you know, trying to get him to the place they're trying to investigate what's going on chapter 19 <laughs> now uh scopeek 
this is the scene that Al really loves. <laughs> Skopik <laughs> is the uh, the Zabrak who had blackmailed Juris. Remember, Juris was the uh, the younger student that uh, had been being bullied by some older students, and Skopik the Zabrak. Not, he saved him from the older students, but Juris had been tied down to, to the bed naked. Rather than untie him and help him, uh, so Skopik took a hollow vid of him so that he could blackmail him. You know, uh, took a hollow vid of him uh, naked and vulnerable there and weak so that he could blackmail him. And he's the one that blackmailed Juris to go up and investigate the tower to see what was going on. And uh, Juris, of course, tumbled down with Nictor on top of him. So Juris is infected. So we find Skopik in the shower. He showers at a day that, uh, you know, a time of day that most people don't. So he can kind of, you know, again, scale back on any vulnerable moments he would have there. But he, uh, he senses somebody in the room and he eventually sees Juris, but not Juris. It's like a, a monster version of Juris. Mm -hmm. And he realizes that Juris is, uh, you know, this creature coming at him. And there's a moment in which Skopik, I, I forget the details. I'll fill it in if, if I get anything wrong. But Skopik is jumped up to like the hang on the ceiling, something of the ceiling there. And he sees Juris there on the ground. And Skopik is actually enjoying this. This this monster version of this person is coming after him. Yeah, there's a there. It's 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 well, like you said. It's that it's that adrenaline rush. It's a challenge. Yeah, it, you know, it's like it's it's like well, if I can get you know, if I can take care of this, you know, I'll look that much tougher. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's he's really uh, he is just kind of getting off on it. Yeah. And he's hanging from a vent to like he jumped up on this vent fixture and he's hanging from the fixture and he ripped the vent thing off of it. And he looks down at the at the creature that was Juris and he says, um, say goodbye to your head. And he mm -hmm. takes the circular vent cover and slings it like a discus and slices through Juris's head and he beheads him. Well, Skopik doesn't realize zombies don't die even if beheaded in this version anyway, in this um, telling. So. Go ahead. What what is uh what does the zombie jurist do, Al? <laughs> well, the decapitated body took another shambling step, tilted sideways, fell to its knees, and down on its belly. But of course, of course, he's still hanging up there. But, but then he looks down. The headless monstrosity was still moving. In fact, it was leaning forward, groping around the floor until it found its severed head, sitting back up again and holding the head face forward in front uh, in front of its chest tilting it up in scopique's direction so that the the runny black eyes were staring straight at scopique <laughs> mouth working up and down as if it were chewing on something the mouth open and it screamed first of all the screams on the audio book <laughs> are creepy they are they are <laughs> And, and then Skopik saw the decapitated corpse of Jura Ostrogoth haul back and fling its own head straight at him, <laughs> its mouth still wide open. <laughs> and, it, and it clamps down on his arm, right? And he like puts his hand out to block it, but of course it like starts chewing on him. <laughs> yeah, so, so he gets affected. I'm picturing anyway. all this in my head. I'm just <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a pretty crazy scene, and it's kind of, um, I mean, it's horrific on the one hand, but it's also if you're given over into the horror of the moment and the genre, it is kind of funny. I'm sorry, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's straight out. If, if anyone's seen Return of the Living Dead, kind of like the comedy yeah, version, yeah. you know, of a continuation Night of the Living Dead, it's it's kind of got moments like that, you know, yeah. weird, funny zombie moments. What was that that uh, abominable snowman original sci-fi movie i forget which one it was but the famous scene at the end was the abominable snowman rips the guy's arm off and starts beating him with it <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, what am i watching <laughs> it's just it's a little over the top but it's it's kind of purposely over the top it's it's and this is a good it's, talk about pacing you know so yeah one on the one hand you got really intense moments and then you want to scale back and give people time to breathe but you also want to give a moment of levity and now this is kind of dark but in a horror film or in a horror story like this, a moment like this kind of is levity because Schreiber knows people are going to kind of laugh at this, the absurdity of it, you know, somebody picking up their head and throwing it at somebody so that they can bite them. You know, that's kind of absurd. It's horrific. So it's in keeping with the spirit, but it is kind of a moment of we can laugh a little bit before you go on to some of the scarier stuff. Uh, it's good. So we did make it to chapter 20, our last chapter for tonight. And this is an interesting chapter. Um. We, we were at the dining hall now. Remember that the, the Sith uh, announcing the, the emergency told students they had to return to their dorms. The only place they could go is to the dining hall. So we have Lusk there. Lusk is at the dining hall. 
with uh with everybody and then suddenly the uh not only nectar but a bunch of the zombies so everybody that nectar's infected now this sort of communal swarm of the zombies start to attack and uh i'm going to read this scene because it's really interesting again getting into the the mind of the sith here uh rucker is one of the character one of the character students there that were kind of in his perspective um Rucker, at this point, Rucker, who had approximately 30 seconds left of his life as he knew it, saw the things overtaking the room completely in a series of brief, high contrast impressions. It was like watching some kind of parasite latch on to its prey. Their already wide mouths somehow spread out even wider still, clamping down on the faces and necks and chests of the first rows of victims, taking them down with phenomenal strength and speed. Trays flew, bright helices of blood spurted and looped in the air. The uh, the great bundle, a great bundle of streaming intestines splattered on the floor to Rucker's right with a rip, ripe, coppery smell of meat, fresher than anything that had ever been served here before. <laughs> Gross, Gross. And, uh, and pretty horrific. You know, plus telling us your character has only 30 seconds of life left. That's also intense. It really, really ramps up the adrenaline. Um, Rucker sees all this going on. His vision flickered and grew intensely sharp as if in the final seconds, his, his senses had grown more acute, desperate to take in all that they could before oblivion descended across the dining hall, he caught a glimpse of one of the apprentices standing on a table with both arms outstretched. Two of the living corpses went flailing backwards, slamming into the opposite wall, 30 meters away. So he did a force attack. This is the student that he sees the attacking apprentice. He had long flaming red hair and penetrating green eyes stood perfectly still waiting for the things to come back. Nothing about what was happening seemed to perturb him in the least. In fact, Rucker realized he could actually catch a hint of what the other student was thinking as he looked at the bodies. And this is what the student was thinking. The power, the power. And the other student wanted to be like them. Rucker let out a silent groan. Blood was trickling down into his vision now, blackness closing in fast. But just before it covered him up completely, he couldn't. Fi he could finally make out the identity of the red-haired apprentice standing at the table. It was Lusk. So our bully from the very beginning, Lusk. Mm -hmm. Rucker saw now that he was about to get his wish. Come on then, Lusk was laughing, jeering as the things charged at him. He'd stopped fighting them off and instead had allowed them full access to his wrists, which Rucker saw he'd slashed open with a dinner knife. Blood poured from his arms. Come on, take me. His voice became a scream. This is how, this is what the Sith... The Sith uh, what a moron. I know, but this is the Sith <laughs> desire for power leads to. Yep. Oh, I can totally give over my identity and and uh, and life, mortal life, to have this kind of unadulterated power. Come on, do it. I'm here. You know, everything for power, anything for power. And it's absurd to anybody. You know, certainly us. You know, more of the perspective of Jedi and, and and the good guys here. You know, but that's where the dark side leads to. It's a really great picture of that. And it's 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 moments like that. I think in a horror are even though they they're really pushing the horror or the horrific agenda or envelope there. Uh, they're they're actually good to show you that even though we have mostly Sith in this story, the story is not glorifying the Sith. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have a couple that we're actually rooting for, like Estizo, and we don't know what's going on with Tolka, but uh, in Rojo, of course, her brother. But we're mostly dealing with all these horrible Sith here, and it's showing that it's not glorifying that. It really is a commentary on how they're horrible and everyone's out for themselves and so forth. And we're going to see how that eventually works into the theme. Remember the theme we're tracking here is uh, the tension between everyone for their own self, you know, saving their own skin um, sort of mindless communal aspect and the Jedi who are actually there for the good of the other to help the mm -hmm. other, not for the good of themselves, but for the good of the other communal, you know, a mindless and then the Sith, like everyone the, out for themselves. Almost like the Borg. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Definitely a good one. Man, story's intense. <laughs> I just love it when you throw the head. Tom, 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 Tom. That's all Al could talk about. He kept messaging me about it. Like, that's so funny. <laughs> that's so awesome, man. I want to see that. That would be so, just like so great on screen. <laughs> You know, if they ever did like a uh, like a Star Wars universe kind of show where it was sort of um, an anthology series, you know, uh -huh. they could do like many stories like, you know, the horror thing of this one. You know, they could do like a like a dark mirror kind of thing. Um, yeah. All right. So I'm trying to so, look for what chapters for next time. I know I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to double check how many. So we've got 46 chapters all together and we're at we're about to end here in chapter 21. Um. 
I mean, let me see how because I think that was actually kind of doable what we just did. I thought it was a lot to cover, but that actually went pretty well. What did you think? Um, yeah, we went through pretty quick. I mean, well, maybe we won't go quite as much as that. Let me just um. Yeah, because well, like I said, that was two weeks of reading too. Yeah, yeah. Let's go to. We're on twenty one. Let me see. If this is a good stopping point. It's a good good page count, but I want to make sure the story is a good stopping point. <clears throat> um, I've got a a guesstimation. Let's, let's see how close I am. All right, I think we're gonna go chapter twenty one through thirty. Ooh, okay. Does that Less sound good? Well, that sounds oh, right. Where, where did me. you think? Where, where did you think we were going? Uh, I don't want to say because you might actually make it go there. <laughs> you don't want the extra reading. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not going to say that. I don't want any more homework. <laughs> All I'm right, stupid. we'll do 21 through 30 <laughs> uh, for next week. And um, on the one hand, we could go faster with these. But uh, see, some of the things I'm gauging are that I have to take into account when I when I plan out the, the readings and the pages. First of all, what can everybody do? And some people, you know, this is the, the nature of a teacher. Some people want more reading. Some people can't handle more reading or whatever. But uh, also my own life and, and uh, how much time will I have to prepare for this and that, you know, and um, I've taken all that into account with the other stuff that I've got going on. But I think this is good. So we are going to kind of, you know, we'll get through this book eventually. As I mentioned to Al, I, I'll have to see what when it is that we actually finish this book. The next trilogy that we're actually going to do, as I said before we started this book, is the Darth Bane trilogy. So <clears throat> if you're kind of skipping this one or you want to eventually join in with the next one, you can go ahead and pick up the Darth Bane trilogy or at least the first book of it. Uh, you know, it's it's uh it's pretty it's really popular. It's one of the more popular old republic books. So Disney has re-released it with their stupid legends, but uh, you can find it anywhere. You can also find the unabridged audio if you want that. Um, the same guy Jonathan Davis who did Kenobi reads that one. But uh, well, um, so that's what we're going to eventually do. But depending on when we do finish this one, I might I might take a couple weeks of break and do try to finish up Knights of the Old Republic my game playthrough. I might do those on Thursday nights just to try and finish that up because I've been sort of just doing those whenever I can, which is very few and far between. But I might try and finish that story up, you know, because that's part of the EU too. And some people are watching it to get the story who just aren't gamers. So we'll see. I'll see about that. But the next books we are going to do are the Darth Bane trilogy. We just might have a brief few weeks of gaming in between. We'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm not quite certain about that. But for next week anyway, chapters 21 through 30 of Red Harvest. And we'll continue. We'll try and find out more what Tulk is up to. We'll find out more of what's... uh. The, the, the devolving state of uh, uh, um, Odera's Faustin. Yeah, I think I got that right. Oh, so thoughts on the book so far, Al? Um, I'm enjoying it. Yep. It's a, it, it's, it's a, often, like I said, it's, it's different not to really have a, uh, a hero that is a focus the hero is kind of right right now still kind of on the uh on the uh, outer outer edges of all the action mm -hmm. we're getting all the horror aspect all the uh the zombification of the mm -hmm. sith yeah which is uh kind of fun but it's it's well written like i said you know i'm i'm enjoying a lot of it and uh as uh for horror, I mean, there. I, mean, I know we didn't go into it, but there, there's some gr great, gruesome descriptions. Oh yeah, in yeah. this in this book. Yeah. Anytime you know those aren't going to be things that I naturally pull out. So anytime you think one's worthy mm -hmm. of reading, yeah, go ahead and stop me and read it. That's fine. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's good stuff. Now you're right though. That he is kind of slow in developing a stizo. Um. And again, this is one of the questions I have. You know, for you or other people of the genre in general, is that something that horror? most horror tends to do because the only kind of horror I'm, I'm familiar with are some of the novels of, of Stephen King that I like, but Stephen King always starts with character, main characters even, you yeah. know? And, um, but is that something that horror usually does like really kind of give you the atmosphere and, and sometimes might be slow to develop the, 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 the main central plot of the, the hero that you're following. I don't know this. I've never seen this done before. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, I, cause I'm thinking of it like cinematically, Sometimes you have what's called like the final girl, which I'm I'm assuming is just going to be Hestizo. Well, like the cabin in the woods kind of the version yeah, of Survivor. That, yeah. Well, nobody survived that one, unfortunately. 
Yeah, uh, that's the that's but, the, the the trope they're going with. Uh, yeah, but uh, but like you know, like uh, the the first Friday the Thirteenth movie mm-hmm. might not necessarily be the main character that survives, but it's the worthy one that survives. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back through the chat and just checking in with folks here before we wrap up because I did kind of ignore things. RK Burns was actually asking if anything new stacks book. No, I'm not going to do anything else with tales from the stacks. That was just kind of one shot there. I still have some that I'm shipping out. Um, slow process, especially this week with the lists. but yeah, I've been shipping out. A lot of people have their books already. Um, do have some more people that's just still waiting for it, but I'm getting those out as I can. Um, but yeah, nothing new. I'm not going to do another volume of that or anything. I'm, I'm trying to do some either the, the either super superhero stuff or, um, our fantasy stuff. And I'm going to go through like Amazon, like, um, or, or something like Amazon where it's just buy on demand. So I don't have to worry about a campaign wrapping my head around that. You know, I've often said, I discovered this the other day, just as like a, a brief aside, but, uh, I've said on my channel a number of times, whenever we talked about numbers, I talk about, how I'm so bad with numbers and I'm really bad with organization. You know, people laugh at me about it. And I've often described it. I said, it's like, I'm dyslexic, but with numbers, I finally, just the other day, after 41 years of life and after suffering through this, I realized that's actually a thing. It's called um, dyscalculia or dyscalculia or something like that. It's like dyslexia, but it's with numbers and organization. And it is uh, basically a learning disability or whatever. Now I'm undiagnosed officially, but I was just reading through all the things. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the stuff I've been struggling with all my flipping life. It Being horrible sense. at math classes, like that's me, you know? <laughs> um, it's crazy. I didn't look into more of that, but uh, anyway, that was a total tangent. Uh, Horizon Talker says the thing that stuck out to me in Tolka's trophy room was the flesh eating insects. Zombies writ small. Yeah. 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 Like little mini zombies. That's a guy. I didn't think about that, but they are little mini zombies almost like the, the scarab beetles and they get on her at one time and well, she has to actually, scrape them off before they bite into I her. I mean, they actually, there are, are actually things that do that when, you yeah. know, they're, when you're cleaning like bones and mm-hmm. things like that, you, you stick them in there and they just clean off the flesh. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, a maggot. You use maggots that they'll just eat dead, the the dead, uh, infected. Yeah, stuff and leave uh, natural decomposers. Leave, yeah, they'll just leave the rest behind. Yeah, which is why they used to use them to clean out the infected tissue. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Wolf to Media says I'm still not off the hook for that droid in the return the uh, Knights of the Old Republic game playthrough. <laughs> Those are fun. We'll do the we'll do some more of those here soon. So um I don't know. Tomorrow is uh I still haven't we still haven't got the confirmation if Fan Man's definitely doing his rewatch tomorrow of the world's finest. I don't know if so, you know, we'll be there, but we'll see. Um I did realize though, I posted about it the other day or early this morning before I uh, took Alyssa in. There's a group on Facebook that does like classic Nickelodeon, like when you grew up on Nickelodeon, like I did in the old days, you know, and they uh occasionally they'll do these events and they're going to do a classic snick. It's a marathon of classic. Are you afraid of the dark stories? And I love those. They were like twilight zone for teenagers kind of safe. You know, are you afraid of the dark? They're doing a marathon of like five episodes with the original commercials that were aired back in the day. That sounds amazing. So I posted in the group I was like, I might ditch fan man for this. I don't know, <laughs> but we'll see what time I posted a link in the Facebook group, uh, the Prussia geek Facebook group. It's going to be, uh, that sounds really cool. I like to kind of, look into that a little bit and see that'd be fun so anyway um we should uh coordinate nights if you're ever not going to be with us where we can actually talk about things that you don't like that, <laughs> that we do your like horror star, and star trek horror, <laughs> star trek and yep. a few things like that yep rk burns oh answering the horror question rk burns says this is more akin to romero stories we meet the main character and more follow her them through the world our environment as a guide than for building up her character Okay. Um, yeah, I've only, as far as Romero goes, I've only ever seen the original Night of the Living Dead, um, which is a very wonderful movie, a very good, you know, political kind of, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I just didn't, um, you know, I never not, didn't follow it or more or watch anymore. Crispy says, I just keep going to the base. My base. My base. My, uh, were you here? See my Mad Anthony's Cafe shirt? Yep, my base. I'll, uh, I'll have to play for people one day, you know, plugged in. But yeah, I've been working on stuff. My wonderful sound gear. Sound gear, Ibanez. It's a sweet, sweet deal. Uh, RK Burns says it's almost documentary, and the first character will meet the next ones, and now the first character's safety isn't assured. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. That's right, because every character you meet, you don't know who to get attached to, right? Because mm-hmm. they do, you know, as soon as you hear about this person's plight, they end up dying, you know? So it's, um, 
Are you going to regale us? Nope, I'm just doodling. But I'm going to go now anyway. But we've had a good uh, a good session. So thanks for the book study, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. Had a really uh, uh, participatory study as well. But uh, we'll come back for, for chapters through 30 next week. And um, I will cut out the beginning of this video and put it out as its own, or the beginning of the stream and put it out as its own video on the commentary on the Snyderverse and everything that's going on right now and the Snyder Bros behavior and, and thus so on and so on. And please so. remember Saturday night, 10 o'clock on my channel, 10 o'clock Eastern, Big Al presents films with friends. We're going to be watching the original King Kong versus Godzilla, the 1962 English American version, uh, which is on YouTube. So no excuse <laughs> to not watch along with us <laughs> and, and, have, and have fun watching the, the, the uh, OG Smackdown. Yeah. Yeah. Between these two. Yep, yep. Well, that's also Nutter's network in here, but I was I was on a roll and I didn't I wasn't literally greeting everybody because I'd done the pre-show. But if you're still watching Nutter, hello. Thanks for uh, prayers for Alyssa and all of that. But uh that's it for now. So uh thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Until next time, keep digging deeper and enjoying the hero stories you love. 